So here we are on another Mission Sunday, and as Pastor Darrell uh, mentioned in his prayer, this is our quarterly Sunday to take a break from our regular uh, way of doing things, our regular routine, so to speak, and instead focus on the mission of the church, which is spreading the gospel. We do that locally, we do that worldwide, and this week we have Mark, who is one of the case managers at Open House, he's going to come and speak to us. I uh, want to remind you at the end of the month, or end of October, we will do another uh, family birthday dinner at Open House, uh, and since it's all on Halloween, we'll be doing sort of a harvest carnival kind of a thing, games and whatnot for the kids. We'll be doing soups for the dinner, so next Sunday you can sign up for that. Um, and also after this service, when Mark is done, I hope you're all still feeling generous because we'll take a, a second offering that will benefit Open House. So with that, all right, Mark, bless you. we're going to enjoy your word. All right, thank you. All right, thank you to Parkside uh, for having me here today and uh, such a warm welcome. It's really noticeable uh, how you engage with the people that come and join you. And thank you to Parkside for coming on Thursday nights. I missed this last one, but uh, we very much appreciate it. And uh, the fact that you come out to open house and the people are grateful. They, they know uh, that they are warmly embraced when Parkside's there. So I want to share with you a little bit about the ministry of open house. And, uh, but first, I really need to lead in with getting it back to Jesus, because he's really the cornerstone of all things. And I was sitting, as I prepared for today, I was wondering if I had to put my finger on my very favorite scripture in all of the word, how, how do you come up with that? Because you could come up with dozens, couldn't you? But, but if I had to really boil down by far the scripture that means the most to me today uh, in all scripture, it's Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. And... Um, these are the words that Jesus echoed again when he went into his public ministry. You can remember with me perhaps that Jesus went public, got a thrilling response in the first part of his public ministry, went back to his hometown of Nazareth, and you can only imagine how this little hometown was so excited to have their hometown boy come home. And he went into the synagogue on a Sabbath in a gathering not a whole lot different than what we have here. And as scheduled, he was the scheduled speaker, and as scheduled there was one section of scripture that was to be recited that day and he issued forth these words from Isaiah 61, 1 through 3 uh, that are written for us in Luke 4. But they're pretty telling words. Listen to these words. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has appointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and freedom to the prisoners, and to declare the favorable year of the Lord. And then you can only imagine with me there was a great pause because everybody that was in that room knew full well that those were messianic scriptures. That they were, they were prophecies anticipating the Messiah would come. And they knew those were uh, very full words of great meaning for the Jews. And then Jesus said this, and today these words are fulfilled in your midst. And at that point... Um, some were probably thrilled that the Messiah was there. And some were less than thrilled and called it blasphemy. To the point where a little while later, uh, many push him out towards the cleft of a hill, trying to push Jesus over the edge and kill him. And Jesus escaped. But I think about those words, and it, it really is the mission and the vision of Jesus, isn't it? That he came as Redeemer, he came as Savior for the poor, the broken, the lost, the lonely, the blind, the sick, the suffering. And that heartens me these days when I live in the same world you do, and you look all around you, and you wonder sometimes, it seems like things are collapsing often, doesn't it? And it feels a little bit to me like things are on the defensive. And I, as a man of God, and you as people of God, you feel almost like we're on our heels a little bit. And yet what heartens me about this is it's really Jesus is on the move. And he's declaring that the kingdom of God is at hand. And that the kingdom of God is here. And it's really, it's Jesus on the offensive coming back and reclaiming people and places and conditions and situations that heretofore were lost causes. 
And so I know what that means for me. I know what that means as I have a Savior, Redeemer, Jesus Christ in my life. And I, I, I know what that means in the ministry at Open House. That there is a Savior, Messiah, Jesus, and He is the hope for the hopeless. Even over on 900 West 12th Street, Vancouver. Great, 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 great words for all of us. Several years ago, Jenny and I, my wife and I, lived in Colorado. And I, we had been there almost 30 years in a little mountain town. Same little mountain town that one of many that was wiped out in the past month by floods. But I was on pastoral staff there. I'm a pastor by calling of God and, and was on staff at church for a good long time. And yet it began to bother me in that area at that time and place where it seemed so often that the church was, was insulated, insulated from the, from the people. And then it, what, what kicked me over the edge was the fact I read something by Barna that said that 80% of people in any given community will never go to any church. And that the, the inverse of that is also true then, that if that's even remotely true, then 20% of our people in our communities are in church on any given Sunday. And is that okay? <laughs> is that okay that 80% are not and 20% are? And it's not okay. And the answer is what you guys know, what you guys demonstrate is that you have to get out. We have to get outside of ourselves and get back into the culture because the culture's dying. But through Jesus, we go back into culture and share Him as the hope for a lost and dying country, a lost and dying world. These are incredible, incredible times, but they're not times to be on the defense. They're actually time times for the church to go on the offense through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Got me? Does that make sense? So let me, let me share with you a little bit about Open House. Some of you are quite familiar, some of you are less familiar. But Open House is a Christ-centered, life-restoring, family shelter ministry. Applying the gospel of Jesus Christ as the hope for the hopeless. Applying the gospel of Jesus Christ to end homelessness in Clark County. So we're a small shelter, been around there for probably 25 years. We have a, probably 150 people in shelter at any given time. But I want to share with you a little bit, maybe the way I can familiarize you with it is the way I would if I was doing an intake with a person. Because if you were sitting there with me, and it could well be that you could be, that any one of us could fall upon calamity and need help, these are the kind of things I would say to you. I would say to you, you are not here because you're homeless, but you're actually here because God wants you here. That there is a reason that your life has caved in and God is all in it. And God wants to speak to you during this time that you're here with us. We differ from a lot of the other shelters in a lot of different ways. One is that we're a private 501c3, so we get all of our sustenance to keep the shelter going by the goodwill of people and churches that, that believe in what we're doing. We're different than the other shelters in so far as other shelters will have you come in and you have 30 to 60 days to, to have shelter and then you're gone. We, we don't believe in that. We don't believe you should lay on the couch and listen to the clock tick. But if you're invited into Open House, we invite you to come in and engage fully in a, in a pretty demanding full-time schedule of training, learning, growing, mentoring, which I'll describe in a minute. But because of that, because we have men and women and children coming into a, a, a structured setting where we can teach and, and work with people, uh, we can have people there for up to a year. And so all of a sudden when we have the opportunity, I have the opportunity, I'm, I'm one of 2.5 case managers that split all of our clients, and, and so I work with families all the time. We, we have the opportunity to get profoundly deep and uh, walk alongside of people over a long stretch. We also have the ability in about, even though we only have 30 rooms in shelter, we have about another 25 rooms in the community that we can take our people that graduate from us and continue working with them for two more years. So potentially we can work with families for three years. 
And during that time, uh, th there's a lot of things that happen. But, but part of what happens a beauty and shelter, and so those of you who come on Thursday nights see it, is that it's not just about getting a roof over your head, but it's about coming in and joining a community. And if we do believe that it was God who had some orchestration involved in who's there at any given time, then we also believe that he's the one that's connecting these dots of lives together, making the intersections of people together as we have a community that's coming together. And as such, we start asking this community to, re to reflect the great commandment, to, to begin to learn to love God and love each other, and we get a, a laboratory right in front of us of how people do with relationships with one another. And if you extend that one more step, what we see is the early the images of church. That we are at Open House, the Ecclesia, the called out ones that, that, that have come together at a certain time and a place, albeit in pretty incredible circumstances sometimes. And so what we have been blessed to see is that God pours out His Spirit upon Open House and incredible things happen. Because it's all about Him. This, the expectations we have of people, I have to talk about them for a moment because they're pretty incredible. We recognize that people are complex, that, that uh, uh, it's not a simple thing to engage in life change. But we have spiritual foundations classes all through our schedules, including devotion times and prayer times and chapel times and Bible studies, three different hours of Bible studies throughout the weeks. We just began a woman's abuse recovery ministry group that meets on Wednesday afternoons to work biblically through people that have suffered through great abuse. We have educational classes through Clark College. We're the last remaining Clark College satellite in Clark County where men and women can come together and get their GED or their diploma or start their prerequisites for Clark College. I teach Financial Peace University on Monday afternoons. We have classes that work on, on anger management and on parenting with people. We have process groups of men's groups and women's groups and communications groups. We have mentoring groups. We have practical life skills groups where we, we teach people things that you and I take for granted. The things that you and I learned by the probability that we were raised in a good home. Many people never got that. And it's easy to overlook that they never learned how to clean a room or how to organize things or how to keep track of, of what they're spending and things like that. Just the very basics. We do a lot of job coaching. We do a lot of job training. We do a lot of, of credit recovery because some of our people get in deep, 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 deep financial holes before they know what happens. But all that to say, all of our adults are busy. Our kids are in school, our adults are busy, and we get a lot of time with our adults. And just take it to heart to know that the cross-section of humanity at Open House is just like the cross-section of humanity anywhere. Yes, we have drug abusers, yes, we have alcoholics, but we have a complete cross-section of America. And God has woven this mix and brought us together for a time and place. Let me just elaborate a little bit, elaborate a little bit on our mission statement. That we are a Christ-centered, life-restoring, family shelter ministry. Christ-centered, let me talk about that for a minute. Fundamentally different than the land in which we live, isn't it? Because we live in a me-centered society, a narcissistic society that is all wrapped up about ourselves and how we feel and how things impress us and that's how we live our lives. So to get someone into a Christ-centered environment and to begin to work with them is pretty, pretty dramatic. I had a family named Johnny and Debbie, middle-aged, man, very charismatic, engaging, gifted, worker kind of guy who has thousands of miles behind him in church question is if Johnny ever let it go from his head to his heart. He's well-traveled in church. Debbie, very, very gifted in social services. Probably a whole lot better than I ever could be. Very, very motivated to be a worker bee. And yet there's one great big hole in their life, and that is a continuous struggle with addiction throughout their lives. Drug of choice is methamphetamine. 
end up with us and sure enough within a short matter of weeks Debbie's wheels are starting to get rolling about about Mark I need to get to work Mark I need to get to work Mark can I go apply for jobs I said no not yet and why was that except that we believe at Open House that God sometimes before he does construction he has to do some destruction and in this image, and I talked about it with Johnny and Debbie, it's like taking an old dilapidated building and you don't just put a coat of paint on it. But you recognize the most merciful thing to do is to take it down to the footers and the foundations. And make sure the footers and foundations are good before the building goes back up. And so we had to get to the footers and foundations. What was it in Debbie's case except, who are you, Debbie? Are you this woman on this resume that is paper thin? <laughs> and inside you're an empty woman that falls into addiction routinely? Or is it possible that the God of all ages has a different thing in store for you? And several months ago, Debbie accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior and is now in a leadership role in her family with her husband who's heavily traveled through church. But they're trying to learn the new way of being a Jesus follower. A Christ-centered shelter a life restoring shelter. I think about in how Jesus said at the tail end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, he said, you know what, there's two trees in life, isn't there? There's the tree of life and there's the tree of death. He says there's two roads in life. There is, there is the small little footpath to righteousness and there is a super highway to hell. And many are those who go upon it. And yet that's the land in which we live, that it, most of the families we deal with are greatly in need of restoration because they've been eaten off the wrong tree, going down the wrong highway for so long. I think of a family named Michael and Mandy, two little kids. Michael is one of our few residents that has good, gainful, full-time work, albeit minimum wage. But that's still good work these days. Mandy is a good woman. However, 30 of her 40 years have been a nightmare. And if you could write a script of what a nightmare could ever look like, that's Mandy's life. I've never heard. I've never heard such a tragic story. So Mandy is trying to figure out how to do life without drugs, which is, the drugs are the symptom of something much deeper. Several weeks ago, Mandy accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. A month later, her husband accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Now it's what, how do you teach a 40-year-old Mandy a brand new way of living? Everything's different. How you respond to authority, how you do your job, how you talk to people, how you don't talk to people, how you gossip or don't gossip. Fundamental changes in her life. Life restoration. Christ centered, life-restoring, family shelter ministry. Several weeks ago, I was wanting to speak in chapel, and I wanted to talk about God the Father. But I realized I wasn't ready. Because I think to talk about a father in church in that setting is a tough subject. Not for me. I love the Father, and if I could give a fraction of His brilliance to that crowd, I'd be so grateful. But I hadn't yet wrestled with how difficult the Father relationship is for most of the room. Realizing there's great damage done. What I enjoyed as a young man of having a great father, what I enjoyed having a great mother and a godly home, that is a minority. And maybe some of us have enjoyed it, but there's a lot of people who have never got it. And so what you have is the sins of fathers visiting the sins of their sons and the sons passing it on to their children. And before you know it, you see right in front of you generational sin. And as I, as I got ready for this, you know, there's one image that came to my mind. And that is this. <laughs> generational sin is this. It's when a man sits in front of me and describes how he's treating his son and before you know it, he realizes it's exactly what his father did to him. And he realizes for the first time that he is raising a son that's going to be just like him unless somebody comes and breaks the chain. Isaiah 61. He's come to break the chains to set the prisoners free. 
And that's the hope. I, I am grateful and thankful. This is far beyond open house. It's all about Jesus Christ. A Christ-centered, life-restoring, family shelter ministry. Last thing. Applying the gospel, applying the good news of Jesus Christ to end homelessness in Clark County. Applying the good news... Last year, I had the honor and privilege of working with a family, a young man, 20 years old, his wife, 17-year-old, and their baby, who is less than one-year-old, homeless. Wife's story was bad. Husband's story was horrific. He had an identical twin brother. Both kids had very bad heart problems which meant that for them that every year they had to have heart open heart surgery because the main aorta wanted to tear away from the heart itself. At age six, mother, no father involved, mother sent identical twin brother off to foster home, left Jonathan at home to raise himself while she went on a terrible lifestyle of her own. So Jonathan gets to us and has a lot of feelings about the home in which he was raised. But at the end of it, Jonathan grew to know that he was free to find freedom. That what Jesus was offering was full and rich and free from all that had come before him. Johnny accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and two weeks later came back and did it again. He just said, Mark, I just want to make sure everything's good. <laughs> and then one summer day, last summer, Johnny died suddenly. His heart, his aorta ripped off his heart. Leaving a 19-year-old wife and his daughter, who coincidentally has the same heart ailment he had. Here's what I wanted to say about that. First of all, thank God for heaven the reality of heaven, the hope of heaven for all of us. Johnny's fine. But I remember conducting the funeral for Johnny. It was in the basement of the shelter. And there were very few shelter residents there, but it was packed with street people. I've never seen so many colors of hair. I've never seen so many body piercings in my life. I've never seen so many tattoos in my life in one gathered place. And yet what was a delight was to be able to share Johnny's hope in Jesus Christ and a God who profusely loved every man and woman in that room. And they didn't have to run any longer. When my life's over, that's one of the things I'll remember, is being able to give verbal assent to what God can do amongst the lost and dying people. The good news in the field of human catastrophe. So in closing, I just want to say a couple things. You guys are already awesome. Okay, thank you. Please help us. Pray, 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 pray for open house. We are undergunned always. <laughs> we are understaffed always. Uh, Underfinanced always. But it's okay. But help us. Walk with us. I know for myself, when somebody calls up and says, Mark, I'd love to know a way to just help. And I'd find out what you like to do and try to find a place for you. I, for example, I got a retired couple that when I'm in a pinch, I call them. <laughs> and I call them. And the last thing that this woman did was help tutor a woman who doesn't speak much English on how to pass her driving test. <laughs> who would have thunk it? That that would have been a way she could have helped, but a tremendous help. But I urge you to come down to shelter. We'd love to show you around. Go to shelter.org and you can learn more about Open House. Um, and continue to walk with us, please, through all these things. Last image and I'm done. We had our block party two weeks ago, which was a way of saying thank you to our neighborhood uh, for being a part of the neighborhood. It ended, the food ended, everything was shutting down. 
and as twilight came, we had been surrounded by hundreds of people all day, homeless, largely homeless people. I saw coming in from the shadows a group of six young people. And all I could do is calm the dark kids. Because there was just, it was darkness. It was darkness. They were coming. They were profoundly different than all the other homeless I had seen. And they were just looking for food. And they had not been indoors for a very long time. Those are our sons and daughters. And they're the sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. And my heart was broken afresh, saying, um, so much, so much to do. And God raised up the people to help do it. So let me close in a word of prayer. I could go on for a long time, but 